Welcome to Walking the Half Torah. I'm Tyler Merwin, and this is Torah Portion, Torah. This week's Torah Portion is Numbers 16.1 through 18.32, and our Half Torah this week is 1 Samuel 11.14 through 12.22. Korach is translated in our English Bibles as Korah, the person. As in our opening line of the portion, it reads, Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Elab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. Number 16, verse 1. This week's portion deals primarily with the people challenging the leadership of Israel, beginning with the rebellion of Korah. And our half Torah will also focus on the leadership issues that the prophet Samuel had to deal with in his day. Let's jump into a review of our portion this week. Korah, a Levite, gathers Dathan and Abiram and On, who are all Reubenites, to lead a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. The first rule of leading a rebellion is to find others who also feel like they have been slighted or cheated and bring them into your cause. Korah's issue is against the priesthood, as he was a regular Levite, but not a priest. He felt that he had the birthright to be the high priest instead of Aaron, as Korah, Moses, and Aaron were all Kohathites. So who else would have a similar issue, that by birthright they should be in leadership? The tribe of Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, the first of the twelve tribes. It's easy to see how some of the Reubenites could be co-opted into Korah's cause, feeling like they were passed over for what was rightfully theirs. And the arrangement of the camp also aided in this conspiracy because Korah was actually camped and his clan was camped between the tribe of Reuben on one side and the Mishkan on the other. So there's plenty of time for Lashon Harah by the campfire at night. As they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly, well-known men, They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and yod heh is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of yod heh Numbers 16, verses 2 and 3. Korah is accusing Moses and Aaron of appointing themselves into leadership and not Adonai actually appointing them into leadership. Adonai devises a test through Moses. All of Korah's company were to show up at the Mishkan with censers to burn incense before Adonai. And through this, Adonai would show who is his and who is holy. This is a high-handed affront against Adonai and against his appointed leadership over Israel. Moses even points out that Adonai had set Korah apart as a Levite, but that wasn't good enough for him. Korah and his company are there with Moses. But Dathan and Abiram refused to even show up. They just sent messages from the camp. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Elab. And they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you must also make yourselves prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Numbers 16, verses 12 through 14. Moses is livid. And honestly, every time I read that, it gets me a little angry too. He has spent so much time interceding on the people's behalf, pleading to Adonai not to wipe them out. And this is the thanks he gets. They even call Egypt, the land of their oppression where they were slaves, a land flowing with milk and honey. And Moses was very angry and said to yod heh Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, and I have not harmed one of them. Number 1615. The 250 men assemble at the Mishkan, with their censers along with Aaron, and they all burned their sacred incense before the Holy One. 
Adonai appears and tells Moses and Aaron to separate themselves from the people so that he might consume them all. Moses and Aaron intercede for the people, so Adonai tells them to just remove themselves from around Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Notice that On has disappeared from the picture. It's thought that his wife had talked some sense into him, and he bowed out of this rebellion. Smart move. Moses went to the camp of Dathan and Abiram and warned the people to dis- distance themselves from them and from Korah. Then Moses declared to the people that if something new happens and the earth opens up and swallows the rebels and all the things, all their things alive, then it is, in fact, a judgment from the Holy One. But if they die the death of a normal person, then it wasn't him. As soon as he was done speaking, the earth opened up and swallowed up the rebels and all of their stuff. Panic ensues on the people, thinking that they will be swallowed up next. And at the very same time, fire came out from yod heh and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. Number 1635. Because their bronze censers were used in a holy service, they were now holy, set apart for ritual use, and were ordered to be made into a covering for the brazen altar. The cover was to be a reminder that no one who is not a descendant of Aaron should draw near to burn incense to Adonai, lest they end up like Korah's company. But on the next day, all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of yod heh Number 1641. Again, Adonai descends on the Mishkan and tells Moses to get away from the people, as he will consume them in a moment. Moses, knowing that the wrath of Adonai has broken out into a plague, tells Aaron to get his censer with fire and incense and rush into the congregation to make atonement for them. Aaron ran through the congregation and the plague stopped, with the dead on one side of him and the living on the other. A total of 14,700 were killed in the plague that day. Adonai then tells Moses to have the heads of the twelve tribes all bring their staffs, all together, each one inscribing their names on their staffs. Aaron's staff and his name would be for the tribe of Levi. So Moses takes all these staves and deposits them in the Holy of Holies overnight. And Adonai will cause the staff of the one who he chooses to sprout. Thus I will make to cease from me the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against you. Number 17.5 On the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. Numbers 17, 8. Moses is told to keep the budded staff of Aaron before the testimony is a sign that Adonai had chosen Aaron. Next, chapter 18 reiterates Aaron the Kohen Gadol's duties. Adonai reiterates all the items from different offerings that are given to the priesthood for their provision from Adonai himself. Next, we're reminded that the tithe from the people are to be collected to sustain the Levites because they were redeemed by Adonai for the service of the Mishkan. Adonai then tells Moses that the Levites are to tithe off of the tithe that they receive, a tithe of the tithe, which is to be given to Aaron the Kohen, Gadol. And this brings us to our half Torah this week. 1 Samuel eleven fourteen through twelve twenty two. Samuel has been the prophet and spiritual leader or judge of Israel at the end of the time of the judges. Beginning in chapter eight, Israel began to cry out to Samuel for a king to be placed over them, so that they could be like the other nations around them. The Torah has specific commandments laid out for the kings of Israel, so Adonai always knew that this day would come. I believe that David, Adonai's anointed, was meant to be the first king of Israel, but the people cried out much earlier, which was a rejection of Adonai's leadership and his timing. In chapter 10, Samuel anoints Saul as the king of Israel, the king that the people wanted. Saul is revealed as king, but not everyone was behind him. 
Then Nahash, the Amorite, attacks Israel, and Adonai uses Saul to rally all the people as one against him. Saul and the armies of Israel struck down and destroyed the Ammonites. Saul gives credit to Adonai for the victory, and this is where we pick up in our story. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingdom. So all the people went to Gil- Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before Yodhevave in Gilgal. There they sacrificed peace offerings before Yodhevave, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. 1 Samuel eleven fourteen and 15. With a renewed faith, after the victory, after a united victory, Samuel gathers the people to anoint Saul as their new king. The people, at least temporarily, are united behind Adonai and behind their new king. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. 1 Samuel 12, 1 and 2. Samuel's time of being the leader or judge of Israel is being transferred to King Saul. Samuel's role as a prophet will still continue, just much more in the background, less visible to the eyes of the people. Here I am, testify against me before Yodhavave and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom, Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me, and I will restore it to you. Verse 3. This is the main tie-in to our Torah portion, when Moses stated something similar to Korah's rebels in Numbers 16.15. They said, You have not defrauded or oppressed us, or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, Yodhavave is witness against you, and his appointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, He is witness. Verses 4 and 5. The integrity of the leaders, both Samuel and Moses, was impeccable. They had been faithful in their positions and never used their authority or position to take advantage of Adonai's people for their personal gain. And Samuel said to the people, Yodhavave is witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may plead with you before Yodhavave concerning all the righteous deeds of Yodhavave that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians, Egyptians oppressed them, then your fathers cried out to Yodhavave and Yodhavave sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot Yodhavave their God, and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them, and they cried out to Yodhavave and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken Yodhavave and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, that we may serve you. And Yodhavave sent Jerubbaal and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you lived in safety. And when you saw that Nachash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when yod your God, was your king. Verses 6-12 through 12. Samuel covers the history of Israel to this point. How the people fell into trouble by forgetting Adonai. They cried out, but Adonai their rock saved them. But now instead of crying out to Adonai for salvation, they cry out for a king. Now verse 11, we see some unfamiliar names of a few of the judges. It's understood that Jerubbaal 
is understood to be Gideon, and Barak is also could be rendered as Bedan. Bedan would be Ben Don or son of Dan, which would be Samson. The judges of Israel were not necessarily great men, though some were, or women but instead they were selected by divine providence and were suited for their generation. And now, behold the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked. Behold, yod heh has set a king over you. If you will fear yod heh and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of yod heh and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow yod heh your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of yod but rebel against the commandment of yod then the hand of yod will be against you and your king. Verses 13 through 15. Samuel lets the people know that the success of the nation, king or no king, will still depend on the righteousness of the people and now of the king. These go hand in hand, as we see time after time throughout Scripture. Even though they cried out for a king and got one, they would still be blessed if they were faithful to the Holy One. But if they rebel against Adonai, if they fail to keep his commandments, Adonai would be against them and their king. Now therefore, stand still and see this great thing that yod will do before your eyes. Is it not a wheat harvest today? I will call upon yod that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of yod in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon yod and yod sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared yod and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your service to yod your God, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. Verses 16 through 19. The land of Israel gets most of its water from the early and latter rains. The early rains being in the fall, usually just after Sukkot, and the latter rains being in the spring. The time of the wheat harvest is the summer, the time of Shavuot. Rain in the land at this time is very rare. If anything, they're worried about fires. But the freshly cut wheat drying in the fields can be damaged by a storm and potentially threaten that harvest. So the sages see this as answering an unasked question. If it was wrong to ask for a king, why did Adonai give them one? Samuel was demonstrating through this sign that sometimes a person can ask for something that is bad for them, and God may grant it. Just as Samuel asked for a sign from heaven that would threaten the wheat harvest, but Adonai still answered. And Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following yod but serve yod with all of your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver. For they are empty. For yod will not forsake his people. For his great name's sake, because it has pleased yod to make you a people for himself. Verses 20-22 through 22. Adonai will never forsake his heritage, his people, as long as we are faithful to him. Our king is coming. The king appointed by Adonai to rule and reign over the whole earth with a rod of iron. Let us look to him for our salvation. And let's do our part as we wait and have the integrity of Moses and of Samuel. I pray this teaching has been edifying. Let's lift up the name of the Holy One. With love, in Esad, Shalom.